All right, guys, please uh, join me in welcoming Solomon Sonia. Thank you very much for coming to this talk. Um, so it's great to be in Sweden. This is my first time and uh, the first time presenting this material as well. So hopefully everything will go well. Um, so here's what to expect. And this is kind of a suggestion of things you might cover. Um, so we'll start with an introduction and background. Um, then we'll go into memory analysis. Um, how can we do memory analysis? How can we do acquisition? And then how do we pivot and do better analysis into threat intelligence? And now, I kind of say this is a, a, a best case scenario, because uh, for the most part, I'll just wave my hands a little bit, and when it's time to stop, whenever I'm uh, out of time, I'll just go sit down in the back. And uh, something I always include is the live demonstration gremlin, uh, because I do live demos, and I, I really like doing live demos, but it's also extremely scary, because uh, always, whenever you're at your house, you're in your lab, you, you, know, you work on software, everything works perfectly. As soon as you get on stage, you want to do a demo, stuff crashes. Okay. Now, if that happens, I'm sorry. I'll try and fix and recover, and if not, well, we'll move on to the next slide. OK, but well, we'll just see uh, what happens. So who am I? Um, I was a pre an assistant professor um, at the US Air Force Academy. Um, and I uh, just recently left that job to handle another uh, higher priority responsibilities until I'm able to return back um, into my teaching. And before that, um, I was a research director, and I also got to do summer research um, at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, in which we were doing research along with um, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, then I worked in intrusion response um, for the Air Force Enterprise uh, Computer Emergency Response Team. Um, I was in charge of the intrusion response and the entire um, enterprise. Um, then I looked at network defense, looking at all of our computer machines that could be compromised, and how do you better respond to compromises, and how do you prevent new ones uh, from occurring in the future. Then I did software reverse engineering, um, software development, and degrees. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's talk about memory uh, forensics um, to, to start out with. Now, one thing I believe um, is that memory forensics, when you look at how do you better protect your computer machine, forensics memory is kind of the hardest thing um, to really grasp, in my opinion. And one of the reasons is it's hard to kind of search and understand what's really going on in that computer machine without the right tools, without the right knowledge, to, to know what exactly you're looking at. But one thing to understand is that if we can perfect how do we look at memory on a computer machine, then we can actually um, be able to solve and extract more malware that's able to hide even our antivirus and other detection mechanisms. And one thing to understand is that every single process, everything that's going to run on that computer, whether it's an embedded device, whether it's a cell phone, whatever, whatever you're using, everything must at one point traverse memory. Thus, if we know how to look at memory, then perhaps we can understand how to better extract indicators, artifacts, and now have a better way of protecting our computer machines uh, in the future. So here are some artifacts that we can actually capture and analyze from memory, processes, running policies that are running. We can actually grab those modules and bring it uh, directly to the um, the hard drive, and now do better analysis on those um, running systems. Process heaps, the memory of a particular program. What is it thinking? What is loaded inside? Perhaps we can get an encryption key as well from the heap. You can extract that from memory. Caches, clipboard, password, unencrypted, decrypted binaries. So nowadays, whenever we're looking at malware analysis, reverse engineering, the good malware, which is now the norm, almost all of them are going to encrypt itself somehow and also have anti-debugging techniques, anti-virtual um, machine um, understanding. So it makes it really hard to really know how am I going to analyze this machine. But if you know at what point to extract that module from memory, dump it back to your computer, now perhaps we can find that unencrypted binary, and now I can do better analysis on it. Files, drivers, handles, which programs are already open, all of that information is going to be stored in memory. Web browsing activity and socket connections. A few more things that we can extract from memory. Domains, URLs, IP addresses. This I really, really, really love because this is kind of our bread and butter with doing our um, threat intelligence to see like, what's actually happening and what is the information behind the domains that we're seeing. Your console activity. So whenever I'm on the terminal typing in information, sometimes that console data is stored in memory. 
And it can be stored in memory for multiple days if you know which memory file to look at, like a hibernation file or a page file. If I know what to look for, then I can extract and see, well, perhaps how did that malware execute itself? What commands did it send itself to run, like an encryption key? Or if it's a ransomware or a crypto locker, what keys is it going to use to encrypt your computer machine? Sometimes you can extract that from memory. Crash dumps, and we get the blue screen of death. Hopefully that does not happen soon. Um, uh, but usually, um, whenever you see the blue screen of death, I, on Windows, of course, you're already annoyed. Usually it's hard to reboot your, your computer system anyway. But, you know, those numbers counting up is actually trying to save an entire image of memory onto your host machine. So we can kind of extract that to see, well, what else was running, what could have um, been the precipice of that computer system crashing. And then hardware device information, registry, hashes, keys, uh, memory things. Now, there are two main types of memory analysis, online and offline. If I say online, I just mean we're looking at a live system. Like, if I'm doing analysis on this computer as it's running right now, this is the live analysis, a live acquisition, because it's on. And now your offline analysis is for a dead system, a system that's off, perhaps it crashed, maybe I know this computer has been compromised with malware, so I extract um, the hard drive and now send it over to other people to analyze. Okay, that's a dead system. There are different ways to look at memory on both um, instances that we're looking at. And now for extracting memory, uh, for looking at the memory, there are a few locations to look for. So if it's a live system, I'm going for volatile RAM. If the system is off, I can look at the hibernation file and see an exact duplicate of the memory at this current state. Um, that's saved onto the computer machine. I can look at the crash dumps from your blue screen of death. I can also look at the page file or swap file. And here are the locations to find those on Windows machines. Now, the difficulties with analyzing memory, I was kind of mentioning this earlier. For one, the information changes constantly. So you kind of have to know when am I going to look, when am I going to scan um, this actual memory um, system that I'm looking for. Parsing and understanding the structure is also a bit difficult. Because on a host machine, you're familiar with browsing from one file to the other, double click here or there. But memory does not necessarily have that type of browsing capability. Because it's meant strictly for the operating system, the firmware, to run whatever it needs and unload modules um, that are running on the computer, unload it into memory, and let things run just fine without the user knowing. That's why it's a bit more difficult to understand how do I go through memory. Except, if we have the right tools, and we'll go through the right tools in the following slides, then we'll know exactly how to carry on in memory forensics. Now, if we start with memory acquisition, um, let's look at a, an online, a live system. Now, there are many, many, many tools that exist out there. I'm just keeping a small list of the ones that I've used that work really, really, really well. Especially the ones that I can um, daisy chain or write a wrapper around so I can now automate that across an entire enterprise. So to start out with, um, we have Dumpit. Dumpit works really well. That's um, going to be one of the tools that we'll demo in this presentation. Um, Mandiant has a tool called Memorize that you can use. It's a command line tool um, that understanding the parameters to send in, it can do an entire dump of live memory. WinPMEM, that's an older tool, but still works very, very, very well. And the same for Velcasoft RAM Capture, Man and Mandiant's Redline, XK Imager, and OSF Forensics. Now, uh, if we look at these, Velcasoft RAM Capture, Mandiant's Redline, FTK Imager, OSF Forensics, and there's another one, Magnet RAM Capture. Oh, so uh, I'm, I've released the slides, so hopefully whenever you get the slides, you'll see that I have a lot of hidden slides here. And that's because for each tool that I, dem I talk about up here, I actually show you the instructions to download that tool and then the instructions on how to run it. Because unfortunately, it's not that straightforward one tool to another, which is why I did this study to see how do we do this and then how do we release that um, to the community to make your analysis much easier and faster. And then honorable mentions. Um, these are tools that I use, but I did not necessarily like all that well, but they still are more if you like. Um, F response, HP Gary, ask them. Um, the reason um, I do not use HP Gary is because it has a 32 bit and a 64 bit. The 32 bit is free, 64 bit, and I believe you have to pay money. So I was like, no. Fast dump, that's an, uh, oh yeah, we spoke about that one. Um, Mantech, MDD, that's an older file. That one I kind of had harder trouble finding. SAN has an entire SIP, SANS, um, they have an entire SIP framework that works well. If you want to establish a, a separate virtual machine to handle um, your analysis, you can use that. PM dump, older tool, and then live KD, that's under Sys internal. Very, very nice using Sys internal tools. However, this one was like, punt, I'm not even going to look at this one anymore. 
because uh, I tried to run it, it was not straightforward. You need other dependencies and requirements. So I was like, it does work. I know it's worked in the past, but since it was more difficult to establish on the analysis, it's like, no, I'm not going to use it. We will use these other tools that are open source and free to carry on our analysis on our image acquisition. Oh, sorry, and one thing to mention um, is that I do the same thing in multiple tools because as an investigator, you should never be too dependent on a single tool. Because if it works today, what happens tomorrow when that tool is deprecated? Or what happens when the company realizes that, oh, this is a really good tool, we should start charging for that. And now you have to pay money, and they know. Uh, just go back to your other free tools and continue on. At least I like to start for free, because it's free. Now, if we look at acquiring memory, so um, this is just one of the tools um, that we'll um, do a demo on today, we'll dump it. And then that's the link if you actually want to download um, this tool. So we'll dump it. You launch it from your command prompt with administrator privileges, or you can also just double click. Um, you enter in your administrator credentials, and then you press Y. That's all you have to do. Dump it does the rest to dump you know, a, a, an entire image of RAM and everything that's going on at the present state of that computer machine. So here's another screenshot of what it looks like as it runs. And when it's finished, you'll have two files. One is a .dmp, your memory dump file. That's going to be as large as the RAM on the computer machine. And then a JSON file. The JSON file gives you metadata about what's happening on the computer machine, like the computer system's name, I believe there's time and other data. Um, if you look at the notes in the slide, you'll see an example of whenever I ran this on my computer machine of what that JSON file looks like. Um, in fact, let's do a demo. Then. We're getting right into demos, let's see. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is just a, a Windows 7 a machine, and we have Dump It, and then we're all, we're, we will be using Volatility to handle um, our analysis. Love Volatility a lot, it's, it's a good tool. Okay, so to start dumping, you can either run it from the command prompt, or you can double click, and then enter in your administrator password. Okay. So this comes up, it says, do you want to run? We press yes, and then it does the rest. Now this might take some time, um, so as it's going, we will come back to it, but that's it. Now we're able to dump the entire memories um, into this one single dump file, and then we can analyze that further. You can send it off to another machine, you can send it off to other people to analyze, or you can analyze it locally. <laughs> Um, on this computer machine. All right, so welcome back. Okay, additional memory analysis um, acquisition tools, similar to what we mentioned earlier, and this is the only other one that we added, was the Magnet RAM um, capture. So that's a, a GUI tool. All of these are um, user interface tools, and these ones, uh, command line, command line. Okay, now let's talk about offline acquisition of memory. So there are a few places that you can look for. One is that hibernation file. So the last time that the computer system went into hibernation file, perhaps it's been on for a while and shut, it goes into sleep, it's been sleeping for a while, it goes into hibernation mode. Then you can actually um, extract this entire hibernation file to analyze what was happening at that present time um, before it went to sleep. That's just instruction on how you enable hibernation file in the computer machine. Now, here, um, I included another helper tool. Because if you are trying to extract a hibernation file on the current machine, like this computer has a hibernation file, I've hibernated it in the past, I want to extract the hibernation file or do like a copy or something, Windows will not allow you to do that by default. But with some searching and some coffee and some expletives, then we found the actual tool um, that can actually allow you to just copy that off for you. And I'll understand the hibernation file is a uh, compressed file. So we'll first have to decompress that hibernation file, and then we can do analysis um, as before. Okay, another place that we can extract memory is the Windows page file. So the Windows page file, this one is a bit different animal to understand. So the page file happens whenever a process or a more memory is needed than the actual RAM that is present on the host operating system that's running at the current time. Well, it actually swaps information between RAM and then the hard drive, so to each process, it's seamless that it has infinite RAM. But really what's happening is the operating system is handling um, context switching uh, between RAM, volatile memory, and then using your hard drive space to offset and have additional RAM for you. But uh, a difficult thing about analyzing the page file is it's not a contiguous memory dump as like your hibernation file or your current system RAM. Because it's pieces, like anytime an a process needs extra RAM, then pieces of that process is now stored into your hard drive. But one cool thing you could do 
Let's look through that page file. Is you can run cat. You can run a concatenation uh, command. You can run a type command. Um, I'll be releasing a separate tool called Xavier. I just programmed it like a few hours ago in the back. Um, but Xavier will allow you to enter in like regex expressions to see can I extract like um, URLs, domains, HTTPs, um, different types of keys from that page file itself. But you can just run a normal strings on the page file and see what's um, actually present on that system. Now, let's see, real quick, if we go back into the, it's gone. Well, all right, so that'll be the first like, demo. Okay, let's look at it. Uh, we have a backup. You did see the command prompt up, right? The command prompt. Interesting. Coming in? You usually have to say something. I, I, maybe I clicked, and, and perhaps, perhaps that's what happened. Because if I look now, these two files were created. And one of them should be a dump file. And the other should be a JSON file. Yeah, so the, um, this, this, these are actually the outputs. I just expected to press something, and then it should um, go away. Yeah, but yes, that's correct. Um, so we do have uh, this, this memory image has been um, saved from this virtual machine, and it's a 4 gigabyte file. So then um, we're going to analyze um, what we actually have. Now, there are different tools um, that exist to now allow us to analyze um, the memory samples. So first we acquire, we do a dump of memory, now we need to analyze it. Extract processes, what socket connections existed at the time, perhaps there are DLLs, what malware samples can we dump um, directly from memory. That's why we go into um, the analysis portion um, of our investigation. Now, there are different tools that you can use to um, handle this analysis. Recall, that's a really, really good tool. Recall, in fact, came out first before volatility. So volatility is, is like a, a brother um, to recall. Except recall runs, uh, from my experience, it runs really, really well on like a Unix Linux system because it's just multiple Python files. <coughs> but I kind of wanted a standalone executable so that I can then daisy chain and write wrappers around that tool to help me enterprise it across an entire enclave. So um, we'll do our analysis using volatility. But other tools that you could use is Mandiant's Redline. That too is a great, great tool um, to run. It's a user interface. If you like GUIs, that's perfect. To me, I like command line. I like everything in black and white text. Um, so I'm like, ah, it's an interface. Um, so I don't use this one, but you can. And especially if you're just getting started, use uh, Mandiant's Redline. YouTube, Mandiant Redline. You'll see how people are setting it up, how to establish it on your computer machine, and then you can go from there. Sans SIF framework, we mentioned earlier, FTK Imager can be used both to extract uh, a memory image and also to analyze what's going on on your um, computer machine. And then we will do our analysis with volatility. So here we go. With volatility, there are some pros and cons with it. So one is a very, very feature-rich investigation framework. It is open source, so you can make changes to it, you can see the code, you can learn from the code, adapt and use it um, as best fits for your environment. It's command line interface. As I said, I really, really, really like command line tools. Um, one of the things I was telling my students one time, uh, let me digress for a second. Uh, I said, there are two things that I love as a programmer, and I love seeing programs run. I said, I love blinking lights and scrolling text. He's like, why? I said, it shows progress. Something is happening. So that's kind of what you get to see um, with volatility. Um, you, you get like plenty of text and output from whatever the analysis that it's doing um, at the time. And then it's also continuously updated by the community. So you pretty much have, um, whenever there's a new operating system that comes out, volatility will then have uh, new plugins and updated modules that allow you to carry on your investigation without having to worry about looking to a new tool. Now, a disadvantage, I love command line. Some of you might not. So I don't know if command line is a disadvantage for you because there's no GUI for volatility, although you can write your own um, user interface on top of that. I'm thinking if I want to do that, I don't know yet. We'll see if it's, it's worth the time. The development you know, takes a lot of time. Um, and now, it does not perform the actual uh, acquisition for you. So I believe recall can do that memory acquisition and then analysis, but volatility doesn't. So you have to already have a separate tool to acquire the memory dump, and now once you have the dump, then you can use volatility um, to carry on your analysis. So it's not a one-stop shop, but once you do have that dump, you can carry on everything else with volatility. And then it's, it's not that intuitive if you're just starting. Um, so w w without like a few how-tos or a few um, demos of seeing it online, uh, it's, it's not that initial, it's not your first program to start with, if I'm honest. 
Um, but once you do understand how to use these plugins, then you're really comfortable and everything is just fine from there. I think we're going to do a demo. Um, so here's um, actually some steps in which I say, um, let's configure our computer machine to understand some things. Because um, something that volatility needs, here's a nice like, profile, yeah. Um, so we need to understand the profile that we're using for volatility. So there are different operating systems that are running. So volatility needs to know how do I go ahead and look at the kernel, um, uh, your, your kernel link list of all of your programs that are running. How do I know how to extract that? It's different based on each operating system. It's different based on each service pack, which is a slight variation on each operating system as well. So you have to know the specific profile, then you can load that into volatility and then uh, continue on. So that's why I put these commands here to try and help us acquire the information we need, and then we can continue on um, with volatility. So let's go ahead and, and just uh, begin that process now. So here I am in our uh, Windows machine. If I launch command prompts, let's go to the desktop. And then the first thing I put up was like system info, because I, I like that command. So if I just do system info, I want to type out the information um, to my desktop, my current working um, directory. If I do system info, text. That one's going to take a few moments to run, so I will launch a separate command file. And then we'll use some other helper files. So what was the other one? Um, like operating system. Yeah, let's find out the operating system. So on one thing on Windows, we can say WMIC, OS, get. It's not that pretty. Let's save it to a text file, OS.txt. And then let's do the same thing, um, but kind of limit exactly what we're looking for. And so that was a separate command um, that I put in. And that's OS get, let's see the caption, CSD version. Oh dear. Yes. Yeah, okay. You're right. All right, I'll start over. Okay, so here we are OS get, caption, CSD version. Value, I'll just save this to OS value at test. And then if I want to start it. So that's just one of the um, outputs that we have. It's really, really simple. It just allows you to see, yes, for sure, I'm in Windows 7 environment, and the service pack is um, service pack 1. Now on this, oh yeah, system info. So on this computer, on this terminal, I did system info. So system info gives me more information, kind of everything that happened on the computer system. Um, so I can see it's uh, host name, Windows version once again, and then also the patches and um, the hot fixes. So a few years ago, I was writing botnets, and I really loved grabbing the system info, because then I'll write, how do I uninstall patches so I can kind of stay on the computer um, even more? So it's a, it's a gift that keeps on giving for both sides, your attackers and your defenders. Now, let's, I believe I saved one other file. Oh, maybe I didn't. Hmm? Okay. Okay. So um, this is also just um, WMIC again. Um, the, the format is not that nice here, but you can kind of. We'll look at this one later. Let's focus on this guy. Okay. So at least we understand we're in Windows 7, 64-bit um, um, operating system. Okay. So what I would do at this point is I would copy off my dump files and then my helper files here. Um, but since that will even take some time to extract it from the virtual machine, I've already included that out here, I believe. Here. Yeah, so I have the memory. I just renamed it memory.dump. Um, on this side, it's easier to type. And then the files that we're looking at. Oh, not every file. Yeah, so we have the OS, the OS value, and then system info. And we'll create the other files in a second. Um, something else I did not show. Um, that will help us. Let's let's do it out here. Okay. With volatility, um, for us to know like the actual plugins that we want to run, um, if you launch um, from a command prompt volatility dash h, and then once it runs, it should show its help file, um, which then gives you like all the applicable plugins that I can run on that computer machine. You know, let me start that over. Yeah, there we go. 
and I must have typed something wrong. Okay, so if we're looking at the help, these are the help options, and I just loaded into uh, a text file so we can kind of scroll and see text differently. Now, these are all the supported plugins for volatility, and then it gives you uh, an explanation of here's what each of these do. And now, what I would recommend, um, one of the best ways to become proficient at this type of analysis, is to go off and to do it on your own. Look at each command, run it, and then see the output, and say, oh, is this helpful for me or not? Now you can start to daisy chain the actual plugins that you like to help you in your analysis in the future. So in particular, I will look, um, I care for like the clipboard, what was actually in the clipboard, what did the user control C, that's stored in memory, um, command line, what was in the command line, um, and command line scan, um, what was actually, what programs ran, and then what information is still rem resident in memory um, that we can analyze. Um, connections and con scan. So these work really nicely for Windows XP. And this pretty much tells you the actual sockets and the connection that you had open um, previously. And then also the program that ran um, establishing that um, socket connection. But it's okay, um, because on uh, like Windows 7 and above, perhaps Windows 8, uh, we can just use NetScan to help us find out what sockets we're running and we can do further analysis from that point. Um, console, um, see the history in the console, like whenever you press up or down, um, what's there. Have some good ones. Let's see what else, which other ones do I really like using. Um, handles, what files were opened, and then which process had a handle to that file. So you can see if there's a program that's enumerating the entire computer machine, then it usually has a lot of handles, or you can see it, has, it changes its handle, which file is it currently I'm looking at over which directory. Hash dump, lorries. So if you want to grab the hash dump of a, of a particular file, try this, try hash dump, see if you can get those hashes, and then even just Google the hash. And many times that MD5 uh, might actually come up to show you, hey, here's a, um, a match um, for that, the keys that could be used to constitute a hash. In other places, you just use Mimikatz to do that for you also. Lovely tool as well. Okay, so I'm just looking at other um, things that you could use. A mem dump, if I want to dump a particular memory um, from a, a specific process, or just look at memory space. I want to dump a segment of memory, I can use memory dump. Let's go down. PS list, we'll um, do a demonstration on that. So this gives us uh, the running processes that were on um, that computer machine at the time. And then prop dump, this is, I mean, the first time I did this, I was, I was in heaven, because I didn't know you can actually extract all these things. So with prop dump, yeah, um, I can enter in the plugin prop dump, I can give the process ID, specific process ID, and then I get that same module from memory onto the computer machine. Now you can grab that and do reverse engineering um, on that, or you can upload onto um, other places like VirusTotal. You can Google this MD5 and see, hey, is that a compromised system? Or a compromised program? Okay, I think that's enough for now. Um, so let's, let's go through and, and just do uh, a demo on some of these. So the first one we'll take a look at, uh, let's do, did I do info? I don't think I've shown you info yet. Let's do this guy. Uh, if we run, so we ran the dash H, so you see all the uh, models that are applicable. Now we'll do the info command, which is dash dash info. And we'll save that to info text. Hopefully this finishes without error. Okay, now let's take a look at the info file. Sorry. Okay, so in the info file, remember I was speaking before um, that we have to understand the profile of each machine that we're analyzing. So this tells us all the profiles that are applicable for this current uh, volatility sample. So based on the operating system, like we are going to use Windows 7, let me go down, Windows 7, Service Pack 1, 64 bit. So we'll come over here and copy this, and now this is a specific profile that allows volatility to know how do I go and extract various artifacts from memory. Then you have additional um, address space information at the bottom, and then the plugins that we saw before, um, that is included here. And now something that's also good is volatility works both on Windows and Linux, um, Unix-based machines. And that's enough. That's, that's about the, the main ones that I use it for. So now we have our helper, helper files created. Let's start to do some analysis on this. So the first one we're going to do is command scan. So let's see what commands could have been run and then what information was spewed out from you know, that process from the command line. Because I, I just ran a few right before I'm coming here. So let's do this distraction. Let's do volatility. 
And then um, we enter in the dash F um, for the file that we want to look for. We give it the path to the memory dump. So again, I extracted it from the virtual machine. I just renamed it memory.dmp um, so you don't have random win windows and the post file name that we're looking at. Then the plugin that we want to use is command scan. Let's start with this one. Now we have to enter in the profile. So that's dash um, hyphen hyphen profile equals, and then a specific profile that we were running. Let's go up. I'm just going to copy that. Profile, and then let's pipe it to command scan.txt. So now all it is running, it's looking through the entire memory sample, and then whatever it finds, it's going to store onto the host machine here. Now sometimes it might, it might take a while, especially based on how large that uh, memory image, or the memory dump that we're looking at, based on how large it is. So we'll just wait a few moments. Okay, it just finished. There we are. Now if we look at command scan, so this is the file that was created. This is everything that was stored from memory for different commands that were run. And you can actually see that these were the commands that I run, I ran right before coming over here. So we have task kill. When I had when patrol running, I got annoyed at this pop-up, so I killed it. And you can actually see the commands that I used um, to kill. I did a ping on Google, um, looked at my network state, R, route, all this information, and system info. So this is really nice. I, I, I'm just, I'm surprised that all of this information is still remnant in memory, even after you've closed those programs, after you've closed the console, some of these things still linger. And that's why it's, it's important to understand how do I do this so I can do better analysis on my computer machine. Because whenever you're doing forensics, you know a system might be compromised. You never really know what was this initial infection, infection um, attack vector or you never really know what other things it's using, so you have to go and find the clues. This is one way to find the clue, and then you can start to get on the right path to really understand what's happening. Okay, let's look at another one. So besides command scan, let's look at um, the console. Command line. So that's just gonna be command line. Command line .text. And whenever it's finished, ah, that didn't take too long. So now what we're seeing is a particular process, and then the command line executions to start that process. So again, this is really nice um, for the way you think about starting a particular program, or even starting a malware. So if you don't always know what was your initial IP address or the domain that you know malware is trying to reach out to, how was it started, encryption keys perhaps for ransomware, crypto locker type of types of attacks. Um, you can um, try and see if you have it here. Because if you can figure out the key that was used to encrypt that system, then perhaps you can start to immediately extract, give the key, and now you don't have to pay whichever country so many millions or hundreds of thousands or fifty thousand dollars or you know whatever it is to unlock the system. Kind of as you were mentioning, what, where were the people, um, the Vikings that would come and occupy a place, the first ransomware? Yeah, so now you can find out um, you know, the, the actual keys that were used on your digital ransomware um, as well. Okay. So all these programs and then the command line parameters that were used to start each program. All right, now we're getting better. I, I, I really like this. I hope you're comfortable with the command line, the text. Sometimes that's what analysis is. It's not glamorous, but you know how to do it well. You know, it's on top of it. Okay, um, let's look at the network scan. Net scan. So if we do the network scan, then hopefully this will tell us um, the actual sockets that were established. Is it still running at the time of the memory dump? Has it closed at a previous time? And then the process that was responsible for each connection if it was still resident in memory at the time of this dump. So this should be the file as it's analyzing our memory dump. And we wait a little longer to finish. There we are. Right, now what we're seeing is the offset in memory um, that we have. This is important to know the offset. So in case we want to go back and dump a specific memory section, this is the offset that you use to enter in for your memory dump command. So it's, it's glorious, it's lovely that it's just right there for you. 
gave a protocol, is a TCP or UDP type of protocol, um, the interface IP address of the host machine um, whenever something was running, and then the foreign address that it connected um, out to, and then the owner. Um, so this is the actual parent process that was responsible for each connection. So similar to your NetStat, but if you don't have, if you're not able to run NetStat, or this is like a hibernation file that we're looking at, I can go back in time and see what was running um, at the instance of this memory now. And one of the things I would do is I would extract like these foreign addresses and I'll throw it into our threat intelligence system um, to see uh, like are these connections good or bad? Because perhaps you can find a, a nefarious connection just by looking at a um, network scan. Oh, PS list. Can I do PS list? Just one more and then we'll move on to threat intelligence. Because that's how we tie these things together. Okay, so for the interest of time, I should have that saved on my computer machine here. This is just its exact um, process list that was running, system name, and then the process ID. So we can use the process ID, that's going to be information uh, important for when everyone's actually dumped that module directly from memory, so now we can do further analysis. Now, understand, whenever you are really reverse engineering a, a, a malware sample and, and the authors were at least decent of writing that malware, that malware is going to be encrypted. That malware is also going to be virtual machine aware. However, if you can get it to run on, an, on a real solid um, machine, freeze the machine, dump RAM, now perhaps you can be successful at dumping the decrypted module directly from memory. That's why this is a really important, really useful um, command. I, I, can't, I, I, I can't stress it enough. It almost makes me want to shed a tear. Okay, so I just want to go back. Okay, so I don't, I don't have a, I don't have one dumped here. So that's good. So if we look at um, this process list, I will just choose any one of these. Like, let's say Chrome, for instance. Is there? I think I had Chrome running. Okay, like this one. So its process ID is nine three six. Now let's go over. Let's go back to our our volatility instance, and let's use the command proc dump. Dump. Then we use dash p for the process ID. And what was it, 936? 936, I don't need to do anything here. And now hopefully if it finds it, it's going to save it as executable. I see an error. Oh, right. Um, you then also have to specify the dump directory. So we'll say dump dash doc dir dump the directory, and I'll just say use the present working directory for um, dot forward slash. Let's try and dump again. And hopefully you can find that process. Yay. So now we have an executable here. Now what do we do with that executable again? We can um, send it over to another type of analysis machine. I can upload this onto virus total, which is really, really, really good um, to, to see like what are your initial indications of a particular file, is this file malicious or not? Well, you can already start to analyze that right now just by dumping the process. So, I can't stress enough how useful um, that command is. And there are so many other things that we can do with volatility itself. Um, I want to show you, um, there are some cheat sheets that are out there. Um, these are like the best two um, that I found. In fact, I think I have them. Okay, so this is um, just a PDF of how do you get started with volatility. Here are some like initial commands. So if you forget kind of what we did here, or you just want to see additional notes on how to use volatility, you can run, um, you can open one of these cheat sheets and then just run the commands, type it yourself, and see how to do various things um, on your analysis and on your computer machines yourself. Okay, this one's a two-page. There's another one that's a bit longer. I kind of like this one. I like this one more. And then the link to find this exact one that we're looking at is right here. Okay, so we've done our demos. Here are the commands that we ran. Now let's move forward. So if we talk about the network data, as I said, I really love right now looking at socket connections, um, URLs, domains, things that are typed, because now I can add that into a threat intelligence machine, and then perhaps we can find out additional artifacts or the actual malicious actors behind various campaigns and various attacks. Um, that we're, we're doing. So let's take a moment um, to talk about threat intelligence really, really, really quickly. 
So if we define threat intelligence, one of the things that I'm kind of annoyed with other people who have spoken about threat intelligence, not here, today all these talks have been good, but other companies try, try and say that, hey, we have threat intel, we have threat intel, and really they don't. It's more like threat data or just nonsense for you to pay them a lot of money in order to say, hey, I don't see any compromise in your computer machine. So one of the things I wanted to talk about initially, whenever we define threat intelligence based on my definition from the Book of Solomon, one thing, uh, it's not just data aggregation, okay? I don't just want dumps of data out there. That's not threat intelligence. And something else I'm saying is that your threat intelligence is not synonymous with your threat data. Now, to understand multiple definitions do exist, but mine that I want to talk about with threat intelligence is that it is a collection of relevant information extracted from data sources, one or multiple data sources, that can be used to instigate some sort of action. So it's intelligence when I can do an action from it. If I'm looking at a lot of people, I have like maybe some image recognition. So the faces that I have, that's your data. But what do I do with those images? Oh, I've just found a person on the terrorist list. FBI or whatever company, we just found someone that we need to investigate further. We need to um, tail that person, follow them further. That's your intelligence that invokes some sort of action. So that's kind of what we're looking for whenever we create um, a threat intelligence um, environment here. And I talk about it, it as a new paradigm in computer security because it's actually completely different in the way we've done security in the past. So previously when we talk about network security, internet security, host machine security, you mainly have your signature based detection and then your statistical anomaly based detection looking at kind of heuristics or variations from a baseline. But with threat intelligence, we kind of change the nomenclature um, to see like how do I actually understand if this is an attack or if this is not an attack. Instead of looking at a signature, I'm also, I'm rather looking at like indicators and artifacts. And now what correlations can we create to really tell us that we found something unique? Now for the interest of time, I think I have five minutes left. I'm, I'm looking, oh five, okay. All right, so I'll, I'll have, I want more time, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> You just have to continue what we have. Um, so um, one, one thing to understand um, with understanding how do you create indicators of compromise from malicious people is to know that people are generally creatures of habit. So I kind of have two main postulates to understand that kind of helps us understand how do we develop this threat intelligence engine. So for one, if we look at the anatomy of a computer attack, like the anatomy, how do I go about attacking a computer machine? Uh, let, let me ask you, you're, you're a hacker, yes? You hack computer machines? Okay. Good, good answer, sometimes, and with permission from everyone, right? Only on your own virtual machines, of course. Oh, of course. So, if I were to say, what are your steps to attack a computer machine? Let's say he has a computer machine that you want to attack. Like, what are your steps? What are your, your main methodology? What, what, what do you do for that? Good? Mm -hmm. Good, reconnaissance, what else? That's correct, so we do some sort of reconnaissance, enumeration, perhaps I'm doing like some sort of scan on the system to see its vulnerabilities, and then we try and exploit it, right? We're trying to penetrate the machine, and after we penetrate, we do whatever we want to do, steal, destroy, pillage, whatever, paralyze, pivot to some other machine, and then hopefully we can do some sort of stealth and persistence, right, to try and hide um, our presence. So you're correct. So that's generally kind of our main methodology for attacking computer machines, that's good. However, I postulate that the attack methodology has actually changed a little bit. Because in the network system um, that I'm in charge, or I was in charge of um, protecting and looking at, an entire enterprise, you will not find anything from the outside if you're trying to scan our computer machines. You won't. Because we have really, really, really good firewalls, different types of architectures that are working to protect that enterprise. But yet our computers are still being compromised with malware day in and day out. That's because your attackers have changed the methodology. So here you do have your main five steps as before. Reconnaissance, scanning, penetration, do whatever else we need, evade detection, maintain access. But on this side, we then have different ways of staging the attack. We put our attacks out there and that allow the people to come to us. Think of like your drive-by downloads, your Trojans. Rachel's here, she's gonna talk about social engineering to come, I'm really excited for that talk. So these are other ways that I can use to actually exploit the computer machine. But understanding your techniques can now allow me to profile you and know who am I actually going to go after and, and attack. And another uh, posture that I have on attackers is there are only three ways that an attacker is actually caught. That, that attacker is good, even mediocre, semi-good. There are only three ways, that, three ways that you can catch them. The first, they were probably too lazy. 
They're using recycled tools, something somebody else has already written. I already have a signature to detect it. Now, whenever that attacker tries to use that on another computer, my antivirus comes up and, and sees, hey, I have a virus. My computer was compromised. Or they were too greedy. They wanted to take too much information too fast. Or they were underskilled. They just did not understand this exploit. If I launch it on the main server, that server goes down, the people know that that system has been compromised. So why are these things important? It's important because if I can understand your common methodologies, then I can be really successful at, at profiling you to understand your new domains, your new um, websites that you have created. Tomorrow, I can detect them today. Or I can detect them even before anyone has seen it because I know what I'm looking for. OK, so let me uh, move forward. Three minutes? OK. All right, three minutes. I'll be fast. OK, I'll be fast. Okay, so here's real quick some information that we can extract from every single domain um, that's out there. We can do is NS lookup to look at the name servers um, and its IP addresses that belong to each system that is um, responding resources to a user. We can also correlate its geolocation based on an IP address so I can um, determine if I have computers that are attacking me, like where are they coming from? Perhaps it's another state, like a, a, a really, you know, evil country out there. You can use your imagination um, for those. And then, really, I want to mine a lot of this who is data, the registration data. That if you can know the registration data behind so many domains, then I can actually find who you are. And when you use the same methodology to um, register new domains tomorrow to attack me, I can also find you. So let's move forward. Um, we don't have time. I have to move fast, move fast. Okay, so let's talk about a case study real quick. Um, because this was kind of like the bane of my existence when I first moved on um, to protecting entire enterprise machines. The Configure virus, the Configure worm, was lovely. I mean, it was bad, don't get me wrong. It impacted a lot of machines. It's still impacting machines 10 years ago. The, this thing is 10 years old. It's still impacting machines. But one of the things that was so good about this Configure worm was it's one of the first like, revolution in current affairs in which it deployed like one of your first ways of seeing DGAs, your domain generating algorithms. So before the configure, before your DGAs, whenever I have a malware sample, I would hard code the domains that this malware sample is going to reach out to. So whenever I reverse engineer that sample, if I see the domains that it's reaching out to, I simply block hole, um, black hole the domain, I sync the domain, so now that command and control is separate. And then if I'm looking across the entire enterprise, I can see other people that are trying to go there, I now have a compromised machine. But with Configure, on a daily basis, that bad boy, one single sample can generate up to 50,000 different domains. One sample. Your sample that your computer is compromised with is different than your sample. So that means on a day, you will generate 50,000, you will generate another 50,000, you will generate another 50,000. So already we can have like a million domains that we want to analyze. But without um, understanding, well, who are the people behind these domains? Previously, we would just block as many as we could. Whenever our block list gets full, we delete the old ones and we add the new, which was a bad way of looking at things. Instead, if we know exactly what to mine, and we know exactly which type of indicators to look for, then I can actually discover who are the real people that we, um, um, who are responsible for these types of attacks. Two minutes left. Two? Two? Okay. All right. Okay, so I would like to introduce you to Excalibur. So Excalibur is a tool um, that I developed. Um, and in fact, Excalibur TIE, Threat Intelligence Engine, um, becomes responsible for doing a lot of attacks, uh, not attacks, um, a lot of analyses and correlations to various sites out there to bring in additional data for us to analyze. Now, when I first created Excalibur, I created Excalibur back in 2013. And then I submitted it to a few conferences saying, hey, I think we're onto something new with Excalibur. And what I found was a lot of conferences were like, no, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was, and, and I was kind of disappointing. I was like, wait, I guess it's, it's too soon to talk about Excalibur. So I actually tabled Excalibur for three years. I was like, I'm going to leave this right now. I will try this again in three years. Last year, 2017, yeah, because I created it in 2014, 2017, I was asked to take at a conference. I was like, this is 2017. Perhaps it is time to talk about threat intelligence again. So the new Excalibur was born. Now, um, I'm not going to do um, one demo, but I'll talk about another one real quick. So here I was, just another case study real quick. I'll show a picture, and then I'll be finished. Almost there, just one minute and a half. OK. OK, so here I am, 4 a.m. in the morning. 
And I wake up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. Why am I up still at 4 o'clock in the morning? Because as a software developer, I use the famous last word. Surely this won't take long to come to a stopping point. And now it's 4 o'clock uh, in the morning. However, this fateful morning was significant. Because I saw on my Twitter feed that this was an entire company, and I actually retweeted from that company, Clear Sky. So I'm not bashing Clear Sky, they did a good job um, with the analysis that they performed. So they said, given these domain sets, just random domains out there, we have found the actual attackers that are responsible for all these domains. And here are the people and the, um, I guess, the artifacts, the indicators of compromise, such that if you see these in the future, you know your computers are compromised with this particular intrusion set. And then they called it Charming Kitten. So me, I look at that, I'm like, oh, good. Here's a domain set specific to a malicious actor. So I created Excalibur, I did not have a guide. I just said, well, I think this will be good, I think this will be good, and I developed it. So then I took their exact malware random domain, I threw it into Excalibur, I said, Excalibur, go do, and let's see what you will come up with. So I will show you kind of what that looks like at this point. So I'm gonna go into this one. Let's stop this. So if I run Excalibur, this is available. Actually, no, this version is not available yet. On Sunday, when I'm finally home, back in the US, you will have this new version. Because the old version is still up there since um, last year, because I've been developing this thing. So uh, just real quick, I'm loading the actual intrusion sets that the other people said. I'm adding it to Excalibur. And now I'm saying, Excalibur, you find the linkages, and let's see how good you are compared to the entire company in which they're finding the indicators. Because if at least we can discover the indicators, then now we know tomorrow, if that same person uses the same techniques to establish new domains, then we found them. So uh, whenever you launch a salver, you, you're going to have like various files. Sorry, I don't have time to talk about what each file um, is. Um, but a few things you can click on. Um, so I wrote a few um, APIs. Um, so if you do want to know like where does each connection that's coming to you on your network, Whenever you launch Excalibur, give it files to analyze. You can click on each one, and then you can kind of see all of its who is data and, and who is um, information. Then I add more, because um, I include IP addresses and also its geolocation, um, which is not standard in your normal um, who is. But now let's go to your main indicator summary. No, not that one, this one. OK, um, so I'm using a mouse, because whenever I look at an indicator, and I think of how do you correlate indications um, together, this is kind of how I see it. So real quick. Um, I, I create like various decision trees. And so based on this decision tree, you as a person can see Excalibur said this is a particular indicator you need to be cognizant of. So if you accept this, you can then publish to the Excalibur intrusion detection system that will also be releasing um, on Sunday so you can have a better um, analysis and protection of your computer. But for instance, uh, if we look at, um, so we look at this tweet. I think they mentioned, if you, you can't see it here, but it's like Isabel something, Isabella whatever, was like the main indicator that the entire company said was responsible in this intrusion set. So whenever I load it to Excalibur, it's like, Excalibur, do not disappoint me, my child. Let's see what you can find. So if we look here, this is the Isabella um, person that that entire company also discovered. So Excalibur actually found it. So again, there are so many domains and ones that are not applicable. Excalibur goes away to only focus on the indicators of compromise. So here, if I'm looking at it, this is Isabella that that entire company um, discovered and said, hey, this is that. So I can use this in the future. Anytime a new domain is discovered, okay, 40 seconds. 20 seconds. Okay, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. I will be fast. Okay, so um, in, in the future, anytime this person uses the same information to discover new domains, then I can immediately detect it and say, hey, this is bad, because I know there are links to previous badness in the past. So in the future, if I see this, I can immediately stop. But one thing the company missed, and I was so surprised, I did not see it. Or I did not see it in their report. So uh, Isabella has like a 3% representation, um, which is pretty significant, even though it's only three. Um, but that's, that's actually showing that out of a lot of random domains, we did find a correlation. But from Excalibur, we then found there's a 50% person here that's even worse than everybody else. And I'm saying, how come the company did not see that? But truly, we're onto something unique. Okay, and then we have various indicators that we can release, and then you can publish this onto the intrusion protection system that we just do not have time um, to talk about, but I, I think I'll vlog about it, so at least we'll have an, an idea. And if you have any questions, I'll be around here, so uh, let, let, me, let me wrap up. We'll just stop here.
Uh, so that's where the uh, GitHub code will be. Uh, any questions? No questions? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but thank you so much.